Hello everybody and a very warm welcome to our webinar, Rare Inherited Disease, 30 Minutes from Data to Report. My name is Charles Stewart and I'm a technical support scientist uh, in the customer support team here at Congenica and I will be chairing today's webinar. <coughs> So I'm joined today by Andrea Howarth, who is Head of Clinical Services here at Congenica, and she's going to be speaking on the challenges and tribulations of whole genome variant interpretation. Then our second speaker is Laura Reed, pre-registration clinical scientist at Congenica, and she's going to be speaking on using Sapientia and how to optimize case reviews from one day down to 30 minutes. So first, uh, a short introduction uh, on Congenica and Sapientia. So Congenica was founded on pioneering research from the Wellcome Trust Sanger Institute and NHS clinicians. <clears throat> and using this research, we have built the gold standard clinical genome interpretation platform, Sapientia, and this is used by diagnostic labs, hospitals, and pharmaceutical companies. So Congenica is a rare disease interpretation partner for Genomics England 100,000 Genomes Project and is used by the majority of the genomic medicine centers in the UK. And Sapientia integrates a suite of powerful analytical tools enabling rapid, accurate, and scalable interpretation of uh, a patient's genotypic and phenotypic data. And so this, uh, and this uh, facilitates a more comprehensive diagnosis and reports. So now on to our talks. First up is Andrea Howarth, Head of Clinical Services at Congenica. Andrea is a state registered clinical scientist and a fellow of the Royal College of Pathologists. She has over 20 years experience in NHS di diagnostic labs. Uh, her special interests include neurogenetics and iron channel diseases. Andrea is one of the first cohort of NHS Innovation Accelerator Fellows. Andrea, over to you. Thanks, Charlie, and thanks for the introduction, and welcome to our webinar. So, genomics is on the cusp of entering mainstream medicine, and this slide, which I've taken from a Deloitte report into genomics in 2015, illustrates well how the bottleneck is shifting down this chain. Large-scale national sequencing projects, such as the 100,000 Genome Project, are exemplars at establishing sample and clinical data collection models. Next generation sequencing is getting easier, quicker, and much cheaper. And the era of the few hundred dollar or pound whole genome sequence is upon us in the next few years. Together, these developments have resulted in a shift in the bottleneck down the chain. And now the success of incorporation of genomics into mainstream clinical specialties will require new approaches and methods to allow us to process data quickly, accurately, and efficiently to interpret variants consistently, and to use this information to develop new treatments, pathways, and interventions for patients. In this webinar, we're going to concentrate on how we can reduce the interpretation bottleneck. Congenica clinical scientists have been using our Sapientia software to work with Genomics England on the 100,000 Genome Project to highlight and interpret variants in whole genome sequences from patients with rare disease. Our aim is to reduce the number of variants for review to a manageable number of likely candidates, whilst at the same time reducing the risk of missing a causal variant, and to prevent evidence and interpretation to the referring centers so that they can quickly review whether the variants highlighted the causal in the context of the patient phenotype and clinical history. Laura will show that the data analysis in Sapientia can quickly and accurately handle large genomic data sets and dynamically filter to reduce the number of variants for clinical review. Often interpretation deals with the detail of individual variants, but it's useful to remember why we're trying, what we're trying to accomplish with this analysis and why standardization of variant interpretation is so important. After all, variant interpretation provides useful clinical information for the patient and the healthcare team looking after them. And because of this, healthcare providers need confidence in how variants are classified. In addition, regulatory bodies such as the FDA are now exploring how to regulate variant interpretation. 
So in a further attempt to standardise interpretation, in 2015, the ACMG AMP published the following guidelines, which are in the process of being adopted across the US, the UK and Europe. They consist of 28 pieces of evidence that combine to arrive at a variant classification. Interestingly, only one component of the guidelines deals with clinical validity component of this cartoon, <coughs> i.e. the association of the gene to phenotype. This is something that's often more difficult to decide on when looking at whole genome sequences in patients. And In our work with the 100,000 Genome page, um, Project, we've often seen multiple examples of atypical phenotypes for previously well-characterized genes. An example may be a Bardet Beadle syndrome patient with isolated retinal degeneration, but lacking any other cardinal phenotypic features. So now we have a comprehensive guideline, everything is going to be standardized. But this clearly isn't the case, as shown by this publication by Heidi Reams Group, which shows in significant intra laboratory variation, even when ACMG guidelines are applied. So in our experience, the absence of specific pieces of information can significantly impact the use of these guidelines for interpretation of whole genome sequence. And in this slide, I'm attempting just to provide a summary of the most commonly observed issues that we've encountered. One of the guidelines refers to assessing whether the variant is more common in population cohorts than would be expected based on the prevalence of the disorder. And this is a piece of information that's really difficult to establish for rare diseases. And even if the disease prevalence is known, the contribution of specific genes to that can be very difficult to establish, particularly for genetically heterogeneous conditions or rare causes of common disease. There are missing diseases, genes, genes associations, and in, there are inherited disorders out there for which the gene has not been associated. Uh, an often quoted figure are that there are 7,000 genetic disorders, but only 3,500 to 4,000 of them being well characterized to date. We're still lacking in um, good reference data sets, although obviously um, data sets such as EXACT are a fantastic resource. But suitable ethnic representation in po population cohorts is still relatively um, poor. And there's also a chronic lack of disease cohorts, particularly for rare diseases. And finally, there are some technical or informatic standardization uh, standards that are difficult to implement. In particular, what constitutes good functional data? What can we class as a gold standard in this case? <coughs> The Ream paper also identified that discordance between labs arises due to variation in application of the standards, but concordance is increased by discussion, sharing, and iteration. At Congenica, we have developed a diagnostic grade integrated clinical decision support tool with standardization and best practice in mind from pipeline all the way through to report. So I just want to deal with these uh, a few factors individually. So our customers can either use Sapientia from VCF onwards or can use our own in-house integrated bioinformatic pipeline for which we use Edico Dragon platform. So Congenical was one of the first in the UK to use the bio, uh, Dragon BioIT processor. It's standardized, it's very fast and it's accurate. And it's one of the platforms that scored very highly in the 2016 Precision FDA Challenge. Data sharing has significantly uh, improved variant interpretation. And Sapientia has been designed to allow users to share uh, variants between um, either between different users or in a multidisciplinary team setting. And this allows a review of multiple patients with the same variant in a single interface. The green paper showed that data sharing was the most powerful way to improve on intralaboratory concordance. External quality assessment. So along with Dragon um, success in the FDA challenge, Congenica clinical scientists have just um, registered to participate in the excellent EQA scheme run by the UK NEQAS in variant interpretation so that we can align our variant interpretations with the rest of the community. 
And as we said before, the 100,000 Genome Project is a national project which includes data sharing and iterative variant review um, for decision making during the project. And finally, ACMG guidelines. Part of our platform roadmap is to develop a flat, flexible automated tool within the software to follow guidelines and allow laboratories to develop workflows that are consistent with implementation of the guidelines. So the last few slides, I've talked about the challenges of pathogenicity assignment, issues with missing, missing information, and our attempts to standardize, um, to address standardization. But one area I'd also like to address is the importance of phenotype collection. Whole genome sequence interpretation of rare disease patients requires systematic capture of the patient's signs and symptoms. This information is essential to direct <coughs> analysis and to prioritize variants. Sapientia allows us by providing an integrated standardized phenotype ontology via the human phenotype ontology tree, which can be expanded and searched to select terms appropriate to the patient. And while HPO is the gold standard, improvements could be made by improvement in frontline data collection, allowing clinicians to collect phenotypes while the patient is still in front of them in the clinic. It could be improved by additional curation of HPO by the clinical experts working to refine and expand HPO terms associated with certain phenotypes. Phenotype-driven prioritization could also be used not just for variant prioritization, but also for the creation of personalized gene panels. And finally, collection and integration of other clinical data from electronic health records and omic data would enrich rich analysis, but it's currently often unavailable. So phenotypes aren't static, they can change over time, particularly in children. So I'm just going to use an example. So in 2015, this child presented without a diagnosis. Um, and in this case, it may be because the gene associated with parents, dis parents sorry, patient's disorder isn't yet published, or that there are suspicious variants, but the patient's signs and symptoms do not support a diagnosis based on current knowledge of the phenotype associated with the gene in question. Reanalysis on a regular basis, for example, every year would allow the detection of causal variants either because of new genes being detected, but also through reinterrogation of existing data because a new phenotype is manifest in the child, for example, epilepsy or another family member has become affected, giving information about inheritance or additional biochemical evidences um, being provided. So reanalysis in the setting of the deciphering developmental disorders, whilst it's early days, it's indicated that reanalysis will yield several percents per year in this particular patient cohort, leading to a rapid diagnosis. So here are a few observations that we've made from the 100,000 Genome Project. And first I'd like to say that the 100K is an absolutely mammoth translational project that's mobilizing genomics for an entire country. And the search protocols are being refined as the project progresses. <clears throat> we are really proud to be a partner with Genomics England and the NHS referring centers in this endeavor. And these are just a few factors that we've observed or we've personally struggled with during the journey of the last few months. So be aware of what is missing, and this is particularly applicable to phenotypes. In the case of probands, we often get presented data saying the phenotype is absent, but we're never really sure whether the phenotype is missing or whether the doctor merely didn't fill in the appropriate part of the HPO terms. And this impacts on our analysis because we use a variant prioritization algorithm that's based on HPO terms. In addition, relatives may be recorded as affected, but often there's uncertainty as to what they're affected with, and often HPO terms are absent, which also affects our inheritance filtering and our workflow. Critical appraisal, particularly of literature, but also of other multiple um, data sources. While stating the obvious, a publication of a variant in a patient with a particular phenotype, even if it matches your patient, doesn't mean that that variant is pathogenic. Additional data sources are evolving and improving. For example, Panelap Gene Panel, which is used by Genomics England, occasionally lacks a gene from a suggested panel, 
or the expected mode of inheritance is debatable. When we find a causal variant in a gene not fully aligned with the patient phenotype or inheritance, we use our judgment and would rather return findings to the referring centre for their final decision as they're the ones taking care of the patient. So beware of complex phenotypes. So up to 5% of patients with complex phenotypes have two or more inherited disorders, and this is demonstrated in the Deciphering Developmental Disorders Study. When the phenotype in question is very distinct, for example, skeletal dysplasia and breast cancer, it can be relatively straightforward. But it's difficult when the phenotypes are overlapping and where there's several potential causal variants, for example, in intellectual disability. So we're often taxed with the question, do you stop when you find a causal variant could explain most of the phenotype, or do you continue with the analysis? Um, and this is something that still taxes, and we deal with it on a case-by-case -case basis. Be careful with mode of inheritance filtering. So if family samples are available, particularly parental samples, the number of variants to review can be reduced very dramatically by inheritance filtering. But you need to take a systematic approach to inheritance filtering to assess all possible modes of inheritance because incorrect assumptions can result in missed variants. An example in case would be when a heterozygous variant indicative when is it indicative of carrier status, for example, an unwanted incidental finding, or when is it when is it causal because, for example, an incorrect or incomplete mode of inheritance has been assumed during analysis for a variant in a gene that can act in both an autosomal recessive and an autosomal dominant manner. These are issues that we've encountered during our uh, assessment of cases for the 100,000 Genome Project. So with data sharing, we've now analyzed, interpreted, and returned several hundred whole genome sequences now as part of the 100,000 Genome Project. And we found that the data sharing functionality of Sapientia within the Genomics England environment has been absolutely invaluable. It's allowed us to compare and interrogate shared variants and shared genes in patients across multiple centers and use the phenotype and clinical evidence to iterate, improve, and standardize interpretation. And finally, for this slide, knowing when to stop. So this is what really taxes at the beginning. So for the first few hundred reports, we found, as Laura will explain, it could take us up to a day to look at a genome. So we used empirical data from detailed analysis of 200 random cases where we spent many hours uh, per case to design, test, test, and iterate our workflow, reducing the time whilst maintaining accuracy. We found that whilst you undertake the analysis, it's always worth reminding oneself that there are gaps in our current knowledge, which means we're unable to provide a diagnosis in some families, no matter how hard we'd like to provide one. Especially, not all disease gene associations have been made. Not all variants are encoding or known non-coding regions. And structural variant detection is just not as reliable as single nucleotide uh, variant detection. And finally, not all cases have a genetic cause. So we found that whole genome sequence interpretation within the context of the 100K is a balance of using empirically designed workflows to enable quick, accurate detection of variants, standardization in interpretation of those variants highlighted, balanced with reasonable throughput whilst reducing the chances of missing likely causal variation. Having all the information to hand in an integrated interface to assess dynamic and dynamically filter thousands of potential candidates has been absolutely key. And before I hand you over to Laura, who will discuss in a bit more detail the analysis, I thought it would be worth finishing with a final slide to put the work on the 100,000 genome in context. So this is Ian, and Ian has bardet beadle syndrome, syndrome, but he doesn't have a typical phenotype associated. In particular, he doesn't struggle with obesity. And largely because of this, Ian and his mum waited 15 years for a diagnosis, which is 15 years of unnecessary, avoidable, expensive, and sometimes, I'm sure, uncomfortable tests. The impact upon individuals, families, and healthcare systems caused by the long delay in diagnosis is profound, which is what makes projects like the 100,000 Genome Project so exciting as it and other national projects like it are establishing the processes and paving the way for genomic medicine era on a national scale. 
it's worth reminding ourselves that the final users of the 100,000 Genome Project are not all going to be expert in all areas. So our output needs to be accurate and standardized in order to be easily accessible and understandable by healthcare providers and ultimately by the patients they service. So finally, as Ian Mums explained, the impact of diagnosis. Getting a conclusive diagnosis has been helpful as we now know what syndrome Ian has, the stage he's at, and how we can best plan for his future and help slow down any further deterioration. So on that slide, I'd just like to so thank you for attending the webinar to date, and I'm going to hand over to Laura, who's going to take you through analysis. Thank you very much for that, Andrea. Fascinating talk. So, uh, <clears throat> Andrea said, next up is Laura Reed, pre-registration clinical scientist at Congenica. Just a little background on Laura. She has over six years' experience working in an NHS diagnostic laboratory. After completing an MSc in Human Molecular Genetics at Imperial College London, she spent several years in research working on the genetics of stroke, obesity, and diabetes. After moving into diagnostics, she achieved registration with the AHCS as a genetic technologist before commencing her training as a clinical scientist. Laura, over to you. Thank you for that introduction, Charlie. Um, yep, as, as you've just heard, I'm going to be talking to you today about how we've optimised our analysis time for the 100,000 Genome Project from what initially took us an entire day to now just 30 minutes. And we've currently reviewed over 600 cases for the 100,000 Genome Project using Sapientia, our decision support platform. And this has been facilitated by the integrated functionality and dynamic filtering that we have available within Sapientia. Uh, I'm going to discuss the strategies and tools available um, which have enabled the Congenica team to reduce our analysis time down so dramatically. To begin, I'll just touch on some of the difficulties that we've encountered uh, when analysing data from whole genome. So the benefits of performing whole genome sequencing are obviously plentiful, but difficulties do arise, and that's not just in the large volume of variants that we've got to search through, uh, but also in the different types of referral that we're receiving and the fact that there's such a wide variety of them. As clinical scientists, we're used to being responsible for a disease service and therefore we become experts in a particular area. Uh, and we know the, gene, the genes associated with these disorders, the types of variants that are likely to be pathogenic, and we're able to keep up to date with newly published literature. But when we're dealing with whole genome data, we're suddenly presented with referrals for phenotypes we're unfamiliar with and for which the genes and mechanisms of disease are also new to us. So I've listed here just um, a handful of the types of referral that we've received that we've received um, as part of the 100,000 Genome Project. So an added complication can be as well that we don't necessarily have family members available for inheritance studies. So in these kinds of situations, how do we identify genes associated with the clinical features of our patients? And how do we determine those variants which are likely to be causing disease? So what Sapientia does is it offers an integrated platform for variant analysis and interpretation. Um, and the integrated browser shown here means that it's not necessary to go out to IGV or elsewhere to visualize variants. And we've got configurable tracks within the browser which allow for a variety of information to be displayed, including coverage, uh, conservation across species, and sequencing alignment. Uh, we've also got a summary tab here, um, which displays a wealth of information on this variant, including things like in silico data, such as polyphen and CIF scores. We also integrate reference data sets, so you can query allo frequencies in different population cohorts. And in addition, we've got the Sapientia knowledge base. Um, and this facilitates data sharing between users, where desired, which um, Andrea has previously mentioned is um, a key feature that a lot of people ask for. And this basically identifies where a variant's been seen before, um, what the patient phenotype was, and uh, what pathogenicity has been assigned in that case. Um, additional tabs that we've got include information on gene coverage, um, protein domains, the relation where your variant is in relation to different protein domains, and gene information via live links to OMIM and relevant literature, which is really invaluable when you're encountering a gene and disease that you are less familiar with. 
And these integrated tools have been invaluable in allowing us to analyze cases in 30 minutes. So what I'm going to do is illustrate the strategies and tools that we have available for analysis within Sapientia using a real example that's been referred to whole genome sequencing. And this patient data has been consented and it's not from Genomics England. This male patient has been referred with cerebellar atrophy and hyperplasia, as we can see from the patient phenotype box here. And no family history was indicated in the referral, but we do have parental samples available for family comparison. So without any filters applied, we've got 22,149 variants that have been called in coding and splice regions. So without the integrated tools available within Sapientia, it would have been incredibly difficult to analyze this case in even a day, let alone 30 minutes. So how did we optimize our analysis time whilst ensuring that pathogenic variants are still identified? So there's two approaches that can be adopted when assessing whole genome data. We can adopt a gene panel approach, whereby we use virtual gene panels containing genes related to our patient phenotype. And this is something that Genomics England has done really well with the creation of Panel App, uh, which is a well-curated source of gene panels with input from um, multiple centers offering expertise across a wide variety of disease areas. Um, a, a similar strategy of uh, filtering on gene panels has been employed by the PAGE study, um, which is a national multi-center translational research study, um, which is also using Sapientia to review their variants. However, in some cases, um, a disease diagnosis, is, disease diagnosis is uncertain, and therefore we might not know what panel to apply. So as an alternative, we might consider a prioritization tool whereby we can look at a broader subset of genes and prioritize our variants according to their association to the patient phenotype. Um, within Sapientia, we utilize Examizer for this purpose, um, and I'm going to discuss Examizer in my next slide. So both of these strategies can be employed with additional tools, such as dynamic filtering, inheritance studies, and application of curated variant lists or knowledge bases. And all of these are incorporated within Sapientia. But firstly, I'm going to discuss variant prioritization. So when you're presented with a large volume of variants, it's really helpful to have um, a prioritization tool to more easily identify these variants that are in genes related to your patient's phenotype. And Examizer is a freely available tool that's been developed by the Sanger Institute and Peter Robinson's team in Berlin, and it was designed to identify potentially causative variants in using HPO terms um, and utilizing gene disease association, animal models, and protein interaction networks. And this highlights the importance of having accurate phenotypic information and standardizing it using HPO terms. In the example that I have previously mentioned, um, our patient has a published pathogenic variant in the TSEN54 gene, which is displayed here. So this variant appears 94th in our list um, before we run any prioritization. However, once Examizer is applied, it's prioritized all the way up to 13th in the list. So what we have to think about is, without having that prioritization tool, would we have been able to identify this variant being so far down in the list? And in addition to applying gene panels or prioritizing variants, there are a number of filters that we can apply to reduce the volume of variants that we have to search through. So we might start by looking at allele frequency uh, to exclude common variants in the population. And Sapientia has got, um, it allows dynamic filtering of all variants in the interface, um, enabling us to take into account disease prevalence and expected allele frequency in various different ethnic populations. And allele frequencies can also be adjusted uh, where a mode of inheritance is known. So, for example, um, we use a maximum allele frequency of 0.1% for autosomal dominant inheritance, but 1% where autosomal recessive inheritance is indicated. We can also filter by that consequence um, and focus on protein coding and splice region variants to highlight those that have a more severe consequence. 
Moving on, um, inherited filtering in Zafientia can accommodate multiple family structures and it can be a really powerful tool in variant identification. Uh, inheritance and consistent with mode of inheritance can be an extremely powerful, um, can be used separately or in combination uh, to narrow down causative variants. And we can also based on expected mode of inheritance in the family. So if I use um, the example that I previously mentioned, where we have no family history indicated, in this case we might want to start by applying a de novo filter to identify um, a new novel, a novel variant in our proban. And um, what we could also do is consider applying the paternal, maternal, and biparental filters to identify recessive variants, which could be inherited in either a compound heterozygous or homozygous mode. So in our example, it turns out the variant had been inherited biparentally. And by applying this filter, along with autosomal recessive homozygous mode of inheritance, it reduced the number of variants to just six. And with Xmizer applied, our T754 variant appears at the, at the top variant in the list. And outside of traditional uh, trio structures, Sapientia can also accommodate alternative family structures, uh, such as duos and quads. So what I've illustrated here is um, a duo of two affected siblings. Our proband is indicated there as a male. And family comparison filtering performs a pairwise comparison on each family member to the proband and also takes into account uh, affection status, gender, and zygosity in each case. Um, so here we can see on the right hand table what's indicated is that this variant is present in the affected sister and thus the variant has been called as possibly causal. Uh, lists from curated literature resources can also be applied to identify previously published variants <coughs> or those that have been classified on an internal knowledge base. And these can be displayed in our integrated genome browser, which is shown here. Uh, in this image, we can see our T754 variant, um, which is highlighted. And we have additional tracks that are also present in the browser which highlight that this variant is present on two curated variant lists. Um, it's on ClinVar and it's on an internal knowledge base list with the red colouring indicating that it's been classified as clearly pathogenic. Uh, by clicking on either of these, we'll open a pop-up with more information and links out where it's available for further interrogation. Uh, so in summary, there are two main strategies that have been employed in analyzing data from the 100,000 Genome Project. Um, the approach that's been taken by Genomics England focuses on the application of well-curated gene panels um, to identify variants in genes related to the patient's phenotype. The alternative approach uh, involves prioritizing variants according to their relationship to HPO terms defined in the patient. Uh, and this does rely upon well-defined phenotypes but it can be a really powerful tool in identifying variants from large volumes of data. So what we do is we utilize these strategies in combination to increase our likelihood of identifying pathogenic variants and to reduce the amount of time spent analyzing cases. Uh, both of these strategies are even more powerful when used in combination with other tools available within Zapientia, uh, such as dynamic filtering on things like allele frequency and depth consequence. And having sequencing information from family members is also invaluable in determining if a variant is consistent with the expected mode of inheritance <coughs> of a disorder in a family. And lastly, um, curated variant lists uh, enable easy identification of previously published variants along with the pathogenicity that's been assigned in each case. So utilizing these integrated filtering tools has enabled the team at Congenica to reduce our analysis time for whole genome data substantially down to from what initially took a day to all the way down to 30 minutes. Analysis will take longer when you don't have accurate phenotypic information and if familial samples aren't available for comparison. Uh, but the integrated, the integrated functionality within Sapientia, such as our genome browser, in silico tools and reference data sets, has facilitated this quick analysis. Uh, we're also incorporate, incorporating lessons that we've learned from our clinical review into creation of an integrated decision support tool, which should only improve our analysis and reporting times in the future. 
Um, thank you for listening to me today. I'm going to hand back to Charlie, um, and I look forward to hearing some of your questions. Great. Thank you, Laura. That's a fascinating talk. Um, uh, so anyway, now it's uh, you, the audience, opportunity to ask our speakers questions. So whilst we review uh, your questions, um, I should let you know that you have the opportunity to meet the Congenica team if you are attending any of the following uh, uh, upcoming conferences. So ACMG in Phoenix in March in the uh, United States. Uh, we're also at the Bio IT World um, Expo in Boston in May, uh, where one of our um, members of staff will be giving a talk, uh, Clinical Genomics Research Questions. And finally, we will be at ESHG in Copenhagen, Denmark, at uh, the end of May. <clears throat> okay, so the first question is to Andrea. Uh, and it is, when you are comparing variants between centers, do you have a method of feedback if you haven't fed something back the first time it was seen, but has since changed the interpretation based on new information? Hi, Charlie. Yes, and thanks for that question. We have, in fact, altered a handful of interpretations within the context of the 100,000 Genome Project. And we believe that this has been communicated back to the referring centre by Genomics England. So we coordinate with Genomics England um, on a lot of the clinical questions that are asked of us. And so if we have any queries or anything unusual, we always um, communicate by the Genomics England clinical team. Great. OK. Uh, the second question, uh, what is the time scale for incorporating the ACMG guidelines? So, um, yes, ACMG guidelines, we are anticipating that we're going to incorporate at some point in 2017. So we want to work with our users to be able to incorporate user feedback into developing the tool and, and a relevant workflow. So we have had some customer feedback that some of the tools uh, in some other platforms are freely available are a little bit too clicky or a bit too prescriptive or on occasion a bit too standalone. So we want to ensure that it's going to be as flexible as possible while still fitting in with customer workflow. And also we want to have the option to be able to automate it as much as possible because that's one of the requests that we've received from users. So to Laura, this is a question for Laura. Um, I suppose you mean 30 minutes for curation of variants not including time of generating VCS file from raw sequencing data. Yeah, that's correct. So that 30 minutes that we're talking about is um, for our variant interpretation. So um, at that stage, uh, our variants have already been loaded into Sapientia, um, and we are logging in and basically reviewing the, the data that is available. And it's been really beneficial as well to have um, gels pre-tiering of variants, because this is really it's basically identifying the variants that are most closely associated with your patient phenotype. So it's looking in genes that are in panels that have a high, high evidence related to a certain um, phenotype. Um, so uh, Genomics England are really flagging the uh, variants that are most closely associated with the clinical features in our patient. Um, and what we're going to, what we're really offering is we're coming in and we're looking in um, genes that are in panels that are outside of this. So maybe even genes that have slightly less uh, association with a particular syndrome, um, but you know they have been published before on curated literature resources. And we're basically trying to offer um, something in addition, um, being able to identify something that hasn't been flagged by Genomics England. Um, yeah. We've had a question about how, um, tell us a bit more about Eximizer and how does it work to filter or prioritize variants. So I'll try and handle that one. So Eximizer uses HPO terms and looks in the VCS for variants that match with genes that are described by the HPO terms, looking at protein-protein uh, interaction networks also looking at uh, the normal variant prioritization algorithms such as SIF, Polyphen, Mutation Tester, 
also looking across animal models, in particular um, looking at zebrafish, human and uh, mouse models, and putting all that information together to come up with a variety of scores. So that there's a combined score that rolls all that information together. Um, there's a phenotype score, which highlights variants most matching the phenotype. And there's a variant score, which basically highlights the most likely, um, most detrimental consequence uh, in that particular patient. And it rolls all that information all together and displays that as a ranking of variants in the VCF file from that particular patient. So it changes the list of variants and brings the most relevant towards the top. It works really well with some phenotypes, but may work slightly less well with others, and it is highly dependent upon HPO terms. So if you go and put a high-level HPO term in, such as um, dementia, then you aren't going to get as good results as if you put in much more detailed level um, phenotype data. Okay, so we've got a question. How will CMVs be displayed from, from whole genome sequencing from 100,000 uh, genome project data and when? So this is a question that we really don't yet know the answer to because it's dependent upon when Genomics England want to launch that particular part of the project. So currently, Sapientia has a the ability to be able to display structural variation, copy number variants, and structural variants in a tabular form, and also on a carrygram to be able to interrogate. But we are waiting for the 100,000 Genome Project to let us know when that data is going to be readily available. But I know the intention is that all data from all patients in the, in the project will be available at some point. Um, so we've got another, can you save, store, export results from multiple different analyses settings in and from Sapientia? So as far as, okay, let's deal with one of those. Exporting results, we have an API that allows you to export results between um, different software platforms. So if, for example, your laboratory database has, can accept data in through an API, we can export it either um, in a JSON format is the most usual way. Can we store results from multiple different analyses settings? So if the interpretation happens within Sapientia, yes, we can store it and we can fully audit it. So Laura's got a question for you. 30 minutes is very quick. Is there a risk that accuracy may be affected? Um, yeah, so I mean, we've optimized our analysis procedures so that each sample is going to be dealt with in the same way. Um, and when we've reduced our analysis time, because we did originally take, um, you know, we took, we took a whole day because we just wanted to make sure that we were doing everything we could possibly do to diagnose these patients. But what we've done is we've, um, when we started to reduce our analysis time, we validated um, our procedure using cases uh, with known positives. So we were ensuring that we could still detect everything that we did detect before. Um, and we've continued monitoring our diagnostic yields um, to ensure that it's not dropping off at all, that our pickup rate is maintained with this quicker analysis time. Um, and we do believe that the procedure we follow enables us to detect variants without affecting accuracy. I mean, another problem that we have is that sometimes we don't know, well, what, knowing when to stop is difficult because we do want to do the best for our patients. Um, and as Andrea has mentioned, uh, the landscape of diagnosis is constantly changing. So we can't, if we can't necessarily find a diagnosis now, um, we might well do in the future with complications of uh, novel disease gene association. Um, so we feel confident in the way our analysis has been optimized, um, that we're doing our best in identifying variants in genes associated with the clinical features that we receive in the referred patient. Okay, thank you, Laura. So we have a question that says, what are the requirements to run Sapientia platform 
Is it hosted by the customer or is it cloud? So Sapient here is a cloud-based system. The database is hosted on a, a secure data center in Europe and the web portal um, works by a cloud. So we've got another question for Laura. Can you explain what you mean by dynamic filtering? I don't understand how is it dynamic. Um, yeah, of course. Um, so basically by dynamic filtering we mean that all variants um, are being displayed and being filtered live in the interface. So we've got lots of filters that are available. They can all be um, used and adjusted where, for example, you have a known mode of inheritance or you have um, a gene panels that you want to add and remove. Um, and you've got inheritance filtering that you can carry out. So this can all be done live um, in the interface. Um, and the filters can be used in combination to increase the power of your analysis. Okay. Okay, what types of family-based analysis are supported? Standard trios or extended families? So we can, uh, we support both. So we have um, more than one way of looking at pedigrees. There's a standard trio or we can support uh, multiple complex family members and we do that on a, a direct comparison between the pro band and the additional family member and we calculate whether a variant is likely to be causal based on, effectively based on segregation of the variant across the family. So we've got another question. Can you elaborate on the data sharing functionality across groups? Is it just statistics that are visible across groups or even written summaries of variant curation? So this really depends upon how users want to share data um, who they want to share it with and what information. We can enable users to share multiple different types of data between them. Um, the classic thing that people would like to share are pathogenicity assignments and the phenotype. And I think that's probably the basic amount of information. And we can certainly enable that for users across Across Genomics England, the data that is going to be shared between groups is going to be defined by um, Genomics England themselves, and we will just accommodate that. So it really is configurable depending upon customer requirements. So let's have a look and see if there's any additional questions. Um, yeah, so there's a question I can answer. So it says, you mentioned the need to have a tool with HPO term capture. Uh, whilst the patient is the clinician, is this something that Congenica plans to create? So this has always been uh, something that we are actively looking at, with, especially with um, particular users who would like that solution uh, in their clinic quite quickly. So that is definitely on our roadmap and it depends upon the requirements of our particular user. Okay, we've got one more about security compliances. So what security compliances can Genica have in the US? So we are HIPAA self-certified. Uh, in Europe, we are ISO 27001 accredited. And in the UK, for the National Health Service, we have Information Governance Toolkit 2 and 3 compliance. We have a white paper about data security on our website which you can access um, on regulatory compliance as well as data security. And we currently have three full-time staff um, working on regulatory compliance. So we take it very seriously at Congenica. So the next question, which I'm going to... Could you elaborate on the diagnostic yields you're getting for the Genomics England 100,000 data project? So the overall yield is something that you would have to ask Genomics England about particularly. But what we have noticed is that our, what we class as our diagnostic yield, that is patients with pathogenic or likely pathogenic variants in our view, it depends very much on the patient rever uh, referral and also on the availability of parents. So our average, and this is just average, diagnostic yield on singletons with adult onset disorders 
is around about 23 to 24%. And our diagnostic yield for trios, in particular with intellectual disability, is currently around about 60%. So just as a caveat for that, these are variants that we think are likely or are pathogenic, but we uh, will get information hopefully back from Genomics England, from the referring centres to confirm whether that really is the case. So it is an iterative process. So these are preliminary figures. Okay, that's all we have time for. So I'd just like to say thank you again to Andrea and Laura. Uh, if you have any further questions about the webinar, Sapientia or Congenica, you can email them to info at congenica.com. Thank you for listening and don't forget to look out for our future webinars. Hope you have a lovely day. Bye-bye.